So this is lecture 32. Okay, and uh, we've been looking at constraint complexity equalizers. Let me quickly summarize where we are. Okay, so you have S K entering H of Z. Okay, then to this noise gets added. Remember, H of Z is the complex baseband equivalent. So it's, I think we think of it as a uh, complex filter n of k some noise okay you get this z case i'm trying to design one filter which i called cz at its output i'm going to put a slicer and then hope to get some estimate of s hat okay so on the c of z is constrained in complexity as in right so C of Z is going to be simply summation M equals minus P to P CM Z power minus M. Okay, so it's got the order of this filter is 2P plus 1. This is the order. Okay, order is what? Number of terms, right? So to speak, in the Z transform. Okay, so that's order. So it's finite order. So the question to ask now is. What's the what's a good choice for C of Z? Okay, so this is what we've been looking. So the DFE structure would have feedback around the slicer. Okay, the linear feed linear equalizer structure doesn't have any such feedback. Only one filter, which is the preprocessor. Okay, so this is a linear equalizer. The question we asked was, what is the choice of C of Z? Okay, so there are various ways of choosing it. One way would be the zero forcing method. Okay, but we are not going to see that. We are going to see the mean square error criteria. Okay, so the criteria I had was to call this xk then look at the error ek okay so i defined it as xk minus sk right okay so remember once again we're going to think of ek xk sk all of them as random processes okay so i'm not going to change my notation some typically people use capital letters for random process and small letters for the actual samples but I'm going to simply use the notation and depending on where they show up, hopefully you can understand which of them are the random variables and which of them are the constants. Okay. So for instance, all these guys are random variables, but C is not a random variable, right? So it's a constant vector that I'm going to pick. Okay. So the criteria was to minimize the mean square error, which is expected value of mod square of EK. Remember once again, all of these guys are complex random variables. So each of this EK is a complex symbol. Okay. So I want to pick c such that this quantity the mean square error in ek is minimized okay so this is what i want to pick okay so this could be a criteria and we saw this is a pretty good criteria in de for deciding designing uh, receivers okay equalizer particularly all right so then the question is now to write ek in terms of c right i want to minimize this mean square error over choice of C. So my argument is C. So I have to write it in terms of C and write it in a suitable way so that minimization becomes equal, becomes easy. Okay. So for that we introduced some vector notation. Okay. So my C, I introduced a vector C which is what? Uh, it goes from C L or P or minus P here. I think it is I'm getting confused now. Did I put C P or sorry minus p okay c minus p to you can do it in various ways but c minus p to p is must be consistent so this is my vector c remember c is once again complex okay so this basically represents all the filter coefficients okay so once i give you a vector c you can implement the filter c of c okay so to look at x x k correctly we define this z k which is once again a complex vector i define that as z k plus p z k so on down to z k minus p okay so once you define these two vectors so remember z k is actually a vector random process right so each k you have a random vector and it it is it's updated in a very simple way you just push it one step down and then put the next entry on top so it's a very simple cyclic shift type process okay so zk can be very efficiently represented 
in software or hardware or anything you want to build at the receiver. So it's not difficult to imagine implementing this. Okay. So once you do this, we saw XK was what? Simply C transpose times ZK. Okay. So so once we write this, it's just a simple manipulation from that point on. Okay. So it's just linear algebra manipulation. You have to do it carefully. Because uh, you want to ultimately the goal is to minimize MSC with respect to C. Okay, so you should write it in a way that you can do that easily. Okay, so if you do that, turns out you get three different terms. Okay, so the MSC is written you get three different term terms. The first term is very simple to in fact evaluate and uh, in practice, the first term is simply the energy in the transmitted or the received symbol SK, right? So, whatever that is, you know, how you're carefully modeling. Okay, so this is this is what we've been calling ES all the time. Okay, and then there'll be one more term which involves uh, something of this form. Okay, so here you have to pay some attention because the way you write it, things can go wrong. Okay, ZK star, ZK transpose. Okay, so and then C. Okay, so notice my notation when I put star, I'm going to conjugate each term in the vector without doing anything else. Okay, when I put transpose, I'm going to transpose the vector without doing any conjugation. So if I say star t, then it means doing conjugate transpose. So the notation changes depending on who does it. Some people just use star itself for conjugate transpose and then put a bar or something for uh, conjugation. All these things are possible, but I like this notation. Can I do C t star instead of star t? You will get the same answer. Okay, so it doesn't matter how you write that, but you should write, write both of them to be uh, sure. Okay, but this is not all. You have a third term, which is okay. So it's actually two things which are conjugates of each other. Okay, so you can collect them together and then write it as two times real part of C conjugate transpose expected value of S K Z K star. Okay, so if you're not used to these kind of manipulations, this will not be very trivial. So go go through and make sure you can write ek as ek times ek star, right? And then go through the whole step and make sure you reduce it to this form. Okay, so something that can be very useful. Okay, all right. So so if you notice the first, uh, okay. So now we start. We have to thinking. We have to start thinking about evaluating these expectations. Okay, so for that you need to know something about the distributions of these random processes okay so i don't want to get too specific to a special case so we'll try to keep it as general as possible but one assumption we'll make is all these random processes are jointly white and stationary so individually white and stationary and also jointly white and stationary okay so that will get rid of a lot of things okay so let's look at this term for instance this expectation okay if you write that okay in fact what is this quantity is it a vector or a scalar after I evaluate the expectation? It's a vector, right? Right? Zk star is a vector. I'm doing expectation of a vector, so I'll get a vector. What will be the dimension of this vector? Yeah, so n cross 1. Okay. It has to be because I'm multiplying on the left with C conjugate transpose with this, which is 1 cross n. Okay, and I'm expecting a one number okay so in fact a real number okay so after we take the real part one complex number so it has to be a one one by n so what about this guy that will be a n by n matrix okay so remember that these things are all important to know okay so so let me try to write this first uh, n by one uh, vector expectation it's going to be sk times Okay, the first term of ZK conjugate is Z K keep forgetting what it is. Do you K plus P, right? K plus P conjugate. Okay, remember this conjugate. And then you will have SK times Z conjugate K all the way down to SK times Z conjugate K minus P. Okay, so this is my uh, term, I'm going to call this vector as alpha. Okay, so remember it's once again an n, n by 1 vector. Okay, 
this vector I'm going to call as alpha because it shows up there. Okay. Should I put alpha sub k? Right. There's all kinds of k's floating around in the term. I'm just saying it's alpha. Okay. Should I put alpha sub k or can I just drop the k? What assumption is going to allow me to drop the k? The white sense stationarity assumption. Okay. So I know since S and C are jointly white sense stationary, if I take expected value of S k times Z star k plus any m, it's going to be a function only of that m and the k itself doesn't matter. Since I know it's white sense stationary, I can drop the k. Otherwise, of course, the k will show up in alpha also. Okay. So since the jointly white sense stationary assumption has been made, I can drop the k and I will get certain evaluation. Okay, So maybe at this point I do not even know how to evaluate it, but it is in terms of the cross correlation of S and Z. Okay, So using the cross correlation of S and Z, one might be able to evaluate. Okay, so that is all. But remember it is independent of k. Okay, What else can you say about these entries? It is difficult to say anything else. Okay, Each of these entries can in general be a complex number. Okay, So it is cross correlation, it's tough to say anything about cross correlation in time. Okay, so that is the first term. So now we will look at the other term which is showing up in the quadratic expression. So remember this is this expression the MSC if you actually write it down in terms of the coefficients of C it will be a what is called a quadratic form. It will have C terms it will also have C1 C2 type terms. Well of course the conjugate will show up here and there but C1 C2 types terms it will not have anything else of larger, larger uh, degree. Right? So, it is in general it is only a quadratic form. So, this is the linear term. This The linear term is what we did just now and the quadratic term is what I am going to look at right next. Okay? So, this is, this is a way to look at it. So, let us look at that matrix carefully. That matrix I am going to call phi. Okay? This is expected value of z k star z k transpose. Okay? So let me write down that matrix inside in detail and then we will see it is actually quite easy to see what it is. Okay. So the first row is going to be z k conjugate k plus no let us there is no z k anymore z conjugate okay. Okay, so maybe I should write it uh, just fully first and then we will do that. So I will write it fully. Oh, 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 oh. My notation is going to get into trouble here. Okay, so I need another vector here. This is z k star, z star k, z star k minus p, multiplied by z k transpose. So you get z k k plus p. Oh, there's no k subscript. There's too many subscripts floating around. This get confused. Z k, Z k minus p. Is that okay? Right? Okay. So, okay. So, so that's what that's what we have here. So it's a question of pushing the expected value inside. But you notice all the products are going to be z k and then z k plus m of the form z k times z star k plus m okay, for some m. Okay. That is what? That is the autocorrelation function of the random process z. Okay. So, I am going to define I know I am going to write this finally in terms of autocorrelation. So, I will define the autocorrelation of z which is formally defined as you should be careful here where you put the conjugate depending on where you put the conjugate the plus and minus will uh, show up differently. So, pay some attention here. So I am going to define the autocorrelation as expected value of z k plus m z star k. Okay, so once again it is going to be independent of k by the white sense stationarity assumption. Okay, so once I do that, that goes through. So if I do it, then phi becomes okay. So before that, let us just quickly review one property of the autocorrelation function. R z star of m is going to be what? It's going to be R z minus m. Okay, so this is a property of the autocorrelation. The reason you have this property is because 
Why do you have this property? Well, you can substitute it here and verify it very easily. But there's also another important property for the autocorrelation. What is that? The power spectral density is real and non-negative. Okay, so that's the more crucial property. So if I do uh, say a DTFT here, and if I get some S of epa j theta, this is going to be real non-negative. Okay, the real part will come from just this conjugate symmetry. The non-negative part has to be guaranteed. Okay, you have to check that. So only those uh, autocorrelation, or those functions, those uh, well, autocorrelation is actually a, sim a signal, right? It can also be thought of as a signal. It changes. This is one-dimensional sequence. Okay, so only those sequences that satisfies all these properties can be this matrix me uh, can show up in this matrix phi. Other things cannot show up. Okay, so remember that. It's important. All right, so let's try to write this phi in terms of this R z. So once I do that, phi is going to be, okay, go back and check this. It's You can easily see this. It's just a difference of various things. I don't want to spend too much time on this. Now on the diagonal, you'll simply get R c 0. Okay, you won't get anything else. The diagonal, you'll simply get R c 0. Okay, and the first term will be R z minus 1. Okay, so the way, that's just, okay, so I'm putting square brackets and I suddenly move to, Curve brackets, I apologize for that. So I should put square brackets. Okay, it's going to be Rz minus 1 and so on till Rz minus 2p. Right? Okay, so this one down below will be minus 2p plus 1. Right? And this one would be Rc 2p and all that. No, did I get that right? This will have to be R Z one. Okay. So let me come to that later. Okay, so I'll come to this guy later. Sorry. I think that's wrong. So this will be R Z one. If you keep on writing down this way, this will be R Z two P. Okay. So, so yeah, I was right, I think. This will be R Z minus two P minus one. Okay, so let me write it this way so that you see where it comes from down like this, this will be Rz 2p minus 1 down to Rz. Okay, so this is how it will go. Okay, so you see it's 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 what's called, a, I'm sorry, it's unitary, oh, it's not, I don't know if it's unitary or not, can't say it's unitary, it's, uh, well it's a toplitz matrix, okay, first of all, as in the first column and the first row are the only things that are important. Okay, so everything else depends on just the first column and the first row. Okay, so another way of thinking of it is phi i j is what? Phi i j is the i jth element of phi is what? R z i minus j. Can I say that? Okay. R z i minus j. Okay. You can go through and check it. So i and j will run from 0 to 2p. If I run i and j from 0 to 2p, then uh, phi i j can be written as r z i minus j. Okay, so any matrix which is a function of just the difference of these indices, it's called a toplitz matrix. So this makes this matrix toplitz. Okay, so these matrices have a lot of properties. You might want to study that. The other comment is about Hermitian symmetric. So phi is Hermitian symmetric. Okay, that's very very crucial. Okay, so this ends up solving a lot of our problems. It's Hermitian symmetry. What's Hermitian symmetry? Phi trans phi conjugate transpose is going to be equal to phi itself. Okay, so that's the that's the thing. And the third property, which is once again comes from the power spectral density, is that one can also show phi is what's called positive definite. Okay, so it comes because the PSD is required to be non-negative so you can think about it so positive definite means this quadratic form phi star conjugate phi x will be oh no there's no star after x will be non-negative for all x okay sorry that's why you should go back and revise your linear algebra hermitian matrices need not necessarily be positive definite Right. See, another way of thinking of positive definite is non-negative 
real eigen values okay so hermitian matrix matrices only have real eigen values you can have negative real eigen values and eminently have a hermitian symmetric matrix nothing will stop you okay so positive definite forces the eigen values also to be non negative well real comes from the hermitian things of course you can't talk about complex numbers being greater than 0 less than 0 so of course the eigen values have to be real all those things come through but hermitian symmetric doesn't necessarily mean positive definite okay so this property the quadratic form being non negative is also quite important okay so this is one more thing we'll use okay so the this, this can also be taken as a definition of positive definite you can go by either way and then show that this works okay so the very fact that i'm saying this is greater than or equal to 0 forces the fact that phi has to be hermitian symmetric otherwise if i do conjugate here i'll never get the same thing it has to be real and all that right so this this quantity has to be real first so that will force phi to be hermitian symmetric and then it has to be positive which will say something about the eigen values okay so those are the properties here so typically we'll assume it's positive uh well i think i should say positive semi definite here right so semi definite is equal to 0 also so typically we'll assume positive definite in the sense that it's strictly greater than 0 so all the eigen values are positive they cannot be zero okay so that's an assumption we'll make in most cases it's true as okay so that's phi and uh, notice one can compute this phi given zk right given the zk you can compute it it's, it's after all the autocorrelation okay so one way of doing it is to look at zk find its psd and then do a inverse dtft you'll get the autocorrelation right so you can do that in several ways so it's an eminently computable thing it's not some abstract matrix i'm defining okay so given the statistics of zk or how it's derived in fact given hk and the statistics of nk i can compute all these quantities right zk after all is what sk convolved with hk plus nk so given the stat given hk and the statistics of nk and given the statistics of sk i can exactly compute all these quantities so all these quantities are computable for instance in an exam they are computable okay so don't think that these are not computable you can actually compute them uh, using some very simple things okay so once i write all these things my mean square error can be written in a slightly simpler form we see the minus okay so the, the after all these uh, simplifications or substitutions well i have not really done any major simplification simply doing substitutions my mean square error becomes minus 2 times real part of c conjugate transpose alpha plus c conjugate transpose phi c okay so that's my uh, mean square error so the problem basically is to find a c that minimizes this mean square error so remember once again this is a quadratic form minimizing quadratic forms is is quite trivial if you learn enough linear algebra you will know that its quadratic forms are very trivially minimized and you can do them in several possible ways the way i'm going to do it is um, by i'll show you some two or three ways of doing it the first way is to do by completing the squares okay so just like you minimize a quadratic right if you have a x square plus b x plus c what do you do you complete the square and then you so know that the square can only be positive you set x so that that goes to zero whatever you get has to be the minimum right so it has a unique minimum all those properties you can prove okay so a very similar technique but it since it's vector it becomes a little bit more twisted okay so we rewrite msc to complete squares and you can see that msc will become first term will remain as it is sk squared and you will get a alpha star conjugate phi inverse alpha okay so phi inverse so the very fact i am writing inverse means what i have already assumed positive definite okay so we will assume positive definite plus phi inverse alpha minus c conjugate transpose phi phi inverse alpha minus c okay so i have completed squares so when you complete squares you can actually see what you will get there right so the non negative part will be this quadratic form and since i know phi is positive definite this is going to be strictly greater than or equal to 0 the only way i can make it 0 is what to set x to be 0 okay so this quantity has to become 0 in that case it will become 0 okay and uh, so from here c c to c that c opt or the best choice for c is going to be phi inverse okay and the minimum msc minimum mean square error is going to be es minus 
alpha star transpose C inverse alpha which is actually C of. Okay. So that is my uh, final result. Now this is important enough we can box it. Okay, so the critical thing is to show that these two are actually equal. Okay, spend some time and try to make sure you understand how this uh, completing the squares happen. Okay, so it is not very difficult but you have to pay some attention. Okay, so we readily see to find the optimum C you have to do the optimal filter you have to do phi inverse times alpha. Okay, so phi is your autocorrelation matrix and alpha is the cross correlation vector. Okay, so you do phi inverse times C you get the best possible filter which will give you the minimum mean square error with constraint complexity. Also I have also fixed the order right I said order n the best order n filter which minimizes your mean square error is given by phi inverse. Okay, it was very simple at the end. Okay, so, so the mic is really giving me trouble so looks like I need to Hopefully, it will do something else. Let us see. Okay. I think it is picking up something. So, it should be okay. All right. So, so there are other ways of deriving this. I want to point out one other way because we will use that uh, later in the in, uh, in the theory. So, the other way is to do. Uh, so, look at the mean square error as a function of Okay, so, this is an alternative method for doing the minimization. View it as a, a function of C. Okay, so, it is a vector valued function. Okay, remember C is actually a complex vector. So, you have 2 times n real variables and do some multivariable calculus on it. So, basically find gradient with respect to C okay, and then equate that gradient to 0. Since you know it will have a unique minimum because it is a quadratic form, wherever the gradient goes to 0 should be the optimum value. Okay, so, this is a little bit more difficult because it has been written as with complex uh, numbers. So, you will have to undo that, that thing a little bit, write it properly in terms of multi function, multi variable function. Once you do that, you can find the gradient. In fact, you can show the gradient with respect to C for the MSC is going to be, what can you show it is going to be? It is going to be 2 times phi C minus 2 times alpha. You can show this is the gradient for the mean square error. Okay, it looks like the mic has completely given up. Let me try some more magic. This is not going to work. Oh no. Okay, let me just hold it for a while. We have about 20 minutes to go, right? So should be able to do that fine. Okay, so 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 the gradient is interesting again. So remember this result. We might use it later. The gradient for the MSC with respect to C is going to be 2 phi C minus 2 alpha. It just involves painful differentiation and all that. So I'm not going to go into detail here. But ultimately, it's a quadratic function. So the derivative has to work out to be linear in C. Okay, and that you're getting. Okay, and in fact, it has to have 2 times C because you're doing a C square type term there. Okay, so eventually all these things have to work out. We can see that it will work out very easily. Okay, so from here also you can quickly derive that C opt is going to be phi inverse alpha. Okay, so it's a simple derivation. There's nothing really uh, fundamentally challenging here. It's just a question of carefully rewriting the way we do uh, the way we do the MS. Any questions so far? Anything that threw you off completely? Seems okay. All right. Okay, so so let me uh, quickly let me quickly summarize what's going to happen here. Okay, so so if you want to derive the optimal uh, constraint complexity linear MMSE equalizer. Okay, so that's what we're trying to derive. So deriving. Uh, the MMSC linear equalizer with of order n, okay, of order n, n equals two p plus one, is basically equivalent to solving a solving a linear system of equations.
right okay so it's uh, simple enough to see this and that's basically given by phi times c equals alpha okay given that you know the channel okay so how do you find these matrices what are these phi's and c's and all that c is a n cross 1 matrix alpha is also an n cross 1 matrix this is a n by n matrix and n is 2p plus 1 okay i have written that n is 2p plus 1 already okay and how do you find phi and alpha it's, it's quite easy to see that uh, alpha is going to be okay so i'll start with zk so you're given zk to be sk convolved with hk plus nk assuming i know the statistics of n which is typically assumed to be white and i know what exactly hk is okay so i have to know exactly what hk is then i can find the statistics for z okay so phi and alpha are derived from the statistics of c in fact alpha can be written precisely as expected value of sk z star k plus p so on down to expected value of sk z star k minus p okay so this is what alpha becomes and phi the ijth term of phi becomes okay remember i and j run from 0 to 2p it becomes simply rz the autocorrelation function of i minus j the autocorrelation function of z evaluated at i minus j okay so it's a simple linear equation solving problem all right so that's the summary for the constraint complexity linear equalizer okay so it's uh, I would say it's not technically that difficult but one needs to get used to these various matrices and eigenvalues and all that so it might take some time from that point okay so the next question is how do you solve this linear equation okay if you know if you know the matrices phi and alpha exactly there are numerous numerical ways of solving it right what would be what would be one way what is the simplest straightforward way of doing it it's two goes in elimination find the inverse okay right so that seems like a very good way of doing it but eventually we we would like to go to a situation where we don't know phi and alpha okay what is the only thing that's known we only know z right z we know we have to know something so we know z and maybe we know something about h and alpha by h and n but we don't know h exactly we don't know maybe even the statistics we know the statistics of n of course you can't know n okay so you have only z then in that case whatever method you have for solving the linear system has to kind of work in a way in which you can calculate or kind of estimate phi as well as alpha as well as do the solution of the linear equation so all of those things can be rolled into one nice adaptive algorithm and uh, to go towards the adaptive algorithm we need to try and solve the system of linear equations in an iterative way okay so first i'm going to talk about this iterative algorithm for solving this linear equation given that I know phi and alpha okay, without any too many constraints and then you will see that iterative algorithm can be nicely modified to accommodate a situation where I don't know phi and alpha exactly and it turns out that through the iterations it will also estimate phi, it will keep estimating phi as it runs, it will also estimate alpha, it will keep estimating alpha as it runs, keep adapting to a new h. Okay, so that solution is useful because tomorrow if h changes then you don't have to go and reset anything in your program. Okay, so it's going to continuously adapt in its own way depending on how we program okay so that's what we're going to see see next and that algorithm is called the MSE gradient algorithm okay so like I said it's iterative as in you will start with an unknown C okay so I'll for now I'll assume uh, you know phi and alpha okay we'll assume these things are known you don't know c i'll come up with an iterative algorithm for doing uh, this update finding c okay so iterative as in you start with a c0 which is arbitrary then using c0 phi and alpha you'll update it and find c1 and then you find c2 so on okay so in general i need a update rule for finding cj plus 1 from cj right 
that's all I need once I have a rule like that I can simply apply that repeatedly and get a iterative algorithm the eventual hope is what this will converge to C opt which is phi inverse alpha you might say well I might find phi inverse directly yeah you could find phi inverse but that's not the point right so I'm trying to develop an iterative algorithm so that in the case when I don't know phi also I have some way of running it okay so that's the idea all right so this rule for finding cj plus 1 from cj i'm going to just give it to you and then justify it later okay it's going to be something like this it's going to be cj minus so the the gradient is going to play a role okay so it's kind of like a gradient descent okay so roughly roughly that's what's going to work i'm going to find the gradient with respect to cj for the mean square error okay so i'll write the mean square error explicitly in its notation as opposed to writing msc okay so there's an arbitrary thing here beta by 2 which is the step size which is again used in most gradient descent algorithms and this is the gradient right and what are you doing you're actually moving opposite to the gradient okay so why am i moving opposite to the gradient as opposed to along with the gradient sorry yeah you're trying to minimize right so you're doing a minimization right you're not trying to gradient will point towards the direction where you have the maximum increase okay so you want to go opposite to that you will have the maximum decrease okay so that's what you want to do so it's all see remember this function is a quadratic in c so the gradient and all is very nicely defined there's no problem it will be a very simple gradient descent and you know exactly what that is it's not a very complicated function so you don't have to worry about it too much okay so of course the step size has to be chosen okay so what we'll do next is to try and come up with a nice choice for the step size okay so we'll analyze the convergence and see how it is converging and then based on that we'll pick a suitable step size okay so that's the only thing to choose okay in fact the gradient we know already what it is right already the formula has been derived for the gradient right it's two times phi times cj minus alpha okay so we know two times alpha okay so we know exactly what the gradient is so you see why i've put beta by 2 why have i put beta by 2 as opposed to beta yeah this is a factor of 2 in the gradient okay i want to cancel that and finally the expression should be simple so let's say put beta by 2 okay okay so let's do those substitutions so you see cj plus 1 becomes cj minus this is substitute from the gradient it becomes beta well i put plus here just for uh, making all these things plus so you get alpha minus c c c j right so you play it, play around with it maybe you can write it as i minus beta phi c j plus beta alpha okay so that's the that's the update for c j plus 1 okay so the hope is you start with an arbitrary c not and choose a maybe a small enough beta or a large enough beta or an optimal beta a good enough beta and keep on iterating this keep on repeating it eventually you should hopefully get to the c opt okay so we have to see that and to see that let's uh, let's look at the uh, let's look at let's look at let's look at the algorithm okay so so what happens now is so let's see the error after the j plus 1th iteration okay so that i'm going to call qj plus 1 the vector qj plus 1 is simply cj plus 1 minus c opt okay so what's qj cj minus c opt okay so i'm going to now derive an iteration for qj plus 1 in terms of qj once i do that it will become slightly easier to analyze okay so let me see who's going to give me an expression for qj plus 1 in terms of qj so what is c opt p inverse alpha So I want a form where you have a matrix here multiplying qj.
I minus beta phi. Okay, so that's it. Okay, go through and check that. Make sure that this works out. You're able to do that very easily. It's a simple question of just manipulating with the various variables. Just said there are too many variables for such a small problem. You get confused. Okay, so <laughs> should know which one to drop and which one to use. You'll get this I minus beta phi. Okay, so what happens to QJ plus one in terms of Q naught? power j plus 1 times q0 okay so q0 is your initial error and you're getting it's getting multiplied by i minus beta phi raised to the power j plus 1 to get q j plus 1 okay all right so this is how i've written the error after the j plus 1th step in my gradient descent algorithm okay so now i have to figure out how this matrix is going to behave right so what would I want? Ideally, I want that matrix to go to 0 as j becomes very, very large. Okay. So one way of looking at it is to go to the scalar case. In the scalar case, i becomes 1, beta is beta, phi becomes some phi naught, which is a scalar. Okay. So when will 1 minus beta phi raised to the power j plus 1 tend to 0? When beta phi is less than 1. So something like that we want for the matrix case now. Okay. So that's the only thing. So we want this to tend to the 0 n by n guy. Okay. So when will that happen is the question. Okay. So now we'll start using all we know about phi. Okay. So eventually that's what we will do. Okay. So what do we know about phi? Phi is a Hermitian symmetric symmetric matrix. Okay. So once you know it's Hermitian symmetric, phi can be written using what's called spectral decomposition okay so it turns out for all hermitian matrices you have what's called a complete set of orthogonal eigenvectors okay so you have a set of eigenvectors which are orthonormal okay and they're all eigenvectors for this phi and this span the entire space okay so you have a complete set of orthonormal eigenvectors for any hermitian symmetric matrix which means you can write phi as summation i equals 1 to n lambda i vi vi conjugate transpose okay so then this is an eigenvalue of of phi okay and this vi the set of vi is an orthonormal set okay so what do i mean by orthonormal vi conjugate transpose vj is going to be 0 if i is not equal to j and 1 if i is j Okay, so that's the orthonormality. So any Hermitian symmetric matrix can be written like this. Okay. In addition, we also know phi is positive definite, which means all the lambda i are positive. Okay, positive. Okay, so in okay, actually for Hermitian symmetric, lambda i will already be real. Okay, so you have to pick lambda i to be real. In the positive definite case, lambda i will also be strictly positive, strictly greater than zero. Those are the things we can say. So what we what people typically do is they are they arrange the, the lambdas in descending or ascending order and call the smallest eigenvalues. This is for the positive definite case and even for the general case you can do it but positive definite case all of these guys will be positive. Okay, So you usually arrange it like this. Okay, Is that alright? Okay. So now you go in and do i minus beta phi raised to the power j. What do you think you will get if I do i minus beta phi raised to the power j? Okay, if once you start using the orthogonal property, orthogonality property, you will see that this matrix, when you raise this to the power k, will continue to remain as itself and the only thing that will get modified is the, the eigenvalue will start getting raised to different powers. So eventually you will get i minus i equals summation i equals 1 to n, 1 minus beta lambda i raised to the power j vi vi conjugate transpose. Okay, once again this needs some proving write it down algebraically you can do induction and quickly show this okay so it's not a very difficult thing to show if you use induction all you're doing is just one more stage of multiplication and there the orthogonality property will really be at work okay so you'll quickly get the answer it's not very difficult to show this okay so this gives you a nice handle on figuring out when this matrix will tend to zero when will it tend to zero 
all the 1 minus beta lambda i should be less than 1 in magnitude. If I choose my beta so that 1 minus beta lambda i, all of them are less than 1 in magnitude, eventually this thing will tend to zero. Okay, so that's the simplest uh, possible explanation you can come up with. Okay, so so my MSE gradient converges to C opt if modulus 1 minus beta lambda i is less than 1 for i equals 1 to n. Okay, so since I already have ordered it, only one thing will really matter. Okay lambda max is the only thing that will matter. So, if you satisfy this for lambda max for everything else also it will get automatically satisfied. There is no problem. So, all I have to do is make sure that 1 minus beta lambda max lies between plus 1 and minus 1 or beta lies between 0 and 2 by lambda max. Okay. So, in my MSE gradient descent algorithm if I pick my step size to lie between 0 and 2 by lambda max then I am guaranteed to converge to the optimal solution for my linear equation phi c equals alpha. Okay, so that is the that is the final result. Okay, so typically what people do is you just pick beta to be a small enough value and see if you are converging. Okay, so if you are not going anywhere, you are going around in circles then decrease further. Okay, if you see you are going too slowly, what do you do? Increase further. So eventually after a few attempts, you will get to an optimal beta where you know convergence will be reasonably fast. And at the same time, you will converge to the right value. Okay, in any case, convergence is going to be exponential in J. Okay, you can expect that to happen. Okay, so it's going to be quite fast. Okay, several exponential terms are adding might change slowly. Okay, so if you do more careful analysis, you can show for fastest convergence of CJ to C opt. Okay, so fastest convergence for these guys. Okay, so this may not mean much in terms of mean square error. So be careful with that fastest convergence here you have to choose beta op to be 2 by lambda min plus lambda max okay so it turns out if you look at the so there's one more criteria that you can use you can look at msc j at the jth instant look at msc and expect that to go fastest for that it turns out the better choice is 1 by lambda max Okay, so typically this is a very good choice. Okay, so you just make 1 by lambda max. This will work out very nice. Okay. Alright. So I think we will uh, stop here. Maybe next class we will see a simple example of, uh, of how this works. And then maybe look at more intuition as to how this relates to the channel actually. Okay. So we will see that also as we go along in the next class.